Life imitated art when Paul Hogan fell for his Crocodile Dundee love interest. There was just one roadblock, his wife of 30 years. Paul Hogan told the BBC that a trip to New York inspired Crocodile Dundee's fish out of water tale, saying, I felt like an alien from another planet. Some of the bushy guys I know would feel even more out of place. There's a myth that there is a real Crocodile Dundee, but there isn't. Still, many believe Rod Ansell's 1977 survival story was the inspiration for the character Mick Dundee. Ansell became famous in Australia after surviving for seven weeks on limited supplies in the wilderness after his boat was capsized in the Northern Territory. Indigenous Aborigines ultimately rescued Ansel, but when people learned that he survived off the land and even resorted to drinking buffalo blood, his unlikely survival story fascinated them. Television host Michael Parkinson interviewed Ansel, who told viewers he slept on the floor at the luxury hotel in Sydney, just like McDundee later did in the movie. In 1980, Ansel published his story in the book To Fight the Wild, but Hogan never admitted that Ansel was his inspiration. After Crocodile Dundee became a hit, Ansel grew bitter because he never earned royalties from the film. According to the Herald Sun, in 1999, Ansel died after ambushing police in a drug-fueled shootout that left one police officer dead and other civilians injured. The financing group that funded Crocodile Dundee was the brainchild of Hogan's business partner, John Cornell, who envisioned an inventive model to finance the independent comedy. They actually chose to not partner with the Australian Film Commission because they wanted full creative control over the project. Instead, a Queensland bank underwrote $7.1 million of the film's budget, while Cornell found additional funding from 1,400 small investors, including Michael Hutchins, the lead singer of the Australian band In Excess. After they completed the film, Cornell flew to the U.S. to look for a distributor. According to the New York Times, Paramount snapped up the U.S. distribution rights of Crocodile Dundee when 20th Century Fox turned Cornell down after watching only 20 minutes of the movie. After the first and second Crocodile Dundee movies were huge commercial hits, Cornell told the New York Times that the Fox executive had been extremely rude. I sometimes get pleasure from thinking about what the look is like on his face at a time like this. The first scene in Crocodile Dundee has a big Easter egg referencing Paul Hogan's life before acting. It happens when we see the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the background while Sue Charlton talks to her boyfriend on the phone at the beginning of the film. According to the Canberra Times, before he got his break in showbiz on the talent show New Faces, Hogan worked as a rigger on the iconic bridge. He told IGN that he did the show on a dare and won over the audience by roasting the judges. I went on New Faces to take the mickey out of it. I'm one of the few people that ever went on a talent quest and had no intention or desire to win it. After appearing on New Faces, Hogan was interviewed at the Sydney Harbour Bridge for the show A Current Affair, which brought him to the attention of future business and creative partner John Cornell. Cornell and Hogan started JP Productions, and The Paul Hogan Show made Hogan famous, first in Australia and later in the US after the sketch series became syndicated internationally. Hogan then became the face of Australian tourism with an advertisement inviting Americans to visit the wonders down under. This would later set the stage for the success of Crocodile Dundee in America. Crocodile Dundee was shot on location in Australia and New York City. Production for the Outback scenes was filmed in the isolated Kakadu National Park in the Northern Territory, which had been home to a uranium mine. Craig Bowles, the Australian location scout for Crocodile Dundee, selected the isolated region because, as he explained, it showcased a part of Australia that I don't think had been seen, and it was inherent in Paul's nature. He seemed to fit into the landscape perfectly. Although Kakadu National Park has since become a popular tourist destination, Bowles explained, Kakadu was a very different place in the 1980s to what it is today. Only the main road was paved, and there were no hotel facilities at all, as far as I can remember. Because they were so far from hotels, everyone on the cast and crew slept in huts left behind by the Pancontinental Mining Company. Despite the dilapidated condition of the camp, the cast and crew made the best of it, spending their nights around a campfire and creating a summer camp atmosphere. After test screenings with American audiences, Paramount trimmed seven minutes from the movie to make an international cut. Barry London, president of distribution at Paramount, told the New York Times that they had to quicken the pace to suit U.S. viewers. Most of the cut screen time came from the first half of the film, where Mick Dundee is showing Sue Charlton around the Australian outback. During the test screenings, American audiences also struggled to understand the Australian slang in the film, so much of that was cut as well. Additionally, the F-word was dropped from the movie so it could have a PG-13 rating in the 
the US. Paramount added quotation marks around Crocodile on the posters and the title card so everyone would understand it was a man's nickname and not a movie about a crocodile. Paul Hogan had planned on using a real crocodile for close-ups during the scene where Sue was attacked. This simply wasn't in the cards, so production purchased a mechanical crocodile for $45,000. Although the crocodile that attacks Sue while she's cooling off in the water was animatronic, there were real crocodiles all over the set. They hired an armed guard and a crocodile wrangler to protect the production from croc interference. As Hogan explained to Go Eerie while promoting the very excellent Mr. Dundee in 2021, we had guys up trees with rifles just in case one came along and ruined everything. Hogan told IGN that the water buffalo was the real stubborn diva on set. During the interview, he explained that the scene where he mesmerizes the buffalo took all day, adding, because if the buffalo doesn't want to do anything, it weighs 2,000 pounds and, you know, it doesn't. Paul Hogan met his first wife, Nolene Edwards, when they were teenagers at the swimming pool where he was a lifeguard, and they married young in 1958. Hogan told Australian Story, I had three sons by the time I was 22, so I had to grow up very fast. Although Paul Hogan was still married to Edwards while making Crocodile Dundee, he ultimately left his first wife for his co-star, Linda Kozlowski. Hogan and Edwards had a very public and ugly second divorce in 1989, with Australian media outlets reportedly depicting him as abandoning his family. Plus, I've got five children to think about, and they were just as hurt as I was, but in a different way. Hogan married Kozlowski in 1990 in Australia during a private ceremony at a mansion he built as a wedding gift to his bride. They had a son named Chase and settled in Los Angeles, but eventually divorced in 2014. Kozlowski told New Idea, Honestly, we just naturally grew apart. The divorce was completely amicable. Everybody's happy. Crocodile Dundee hit Australian cinemas on April 24, 1986. Hogan predicted it would be a commercial success, telling cinema papers, I expect it to gross millions of dollars around the world, and I'm planning for it to be Australia's first proper movie. Hogan was right. Arriving in the US in September, Crocodile Dundee was one of the highest grossing films of 1986 and was only beaten at the US box office by Top Gun. It remains to this day the highest grossing Australian film at the Australian box office. The film's success came with a downside, unrealistic expectations. In 2022, Hogan told Mark Meats, because of the ridiculous success of Dundee, which is still the most successful independent film ever made, it's sort of like, oh, whatever I do next will be a flop by comparison, so I bother. So mentally, I sort of retired after the first one. U.S. audiences were already familiar with Paul Hogan before Crocodile Dundee came out because of the Australian tourism advertisements he donated his time to during the 80s. You see, Australia is the world's biggest island, and as you can appreciate, the accent varies noticeably from one place to another. When Crocodile Dundee became an international success, it altered tourism in Australia. In 2016, tourism chief executive Tony Mail told Perth Now, the film helped put Australia on the map. According to The Guardian, they even started giving Crocodile Dundee tours in Kakadu National Park, where the movie was filmed, and in Darwin, where you can have close encounters with live crocodiles. Three hours away in Jabiru, you can stay in the indigenous-owned Kakadu Crocodile Hotel, which is shaped like a crocodile. From there, you can explore the wilderness of Kakadu through guided tours, scenic flights, or arts and crafts lessons with indigenous Aboriginal tribes who have lived in the Northern Territory for at least 40,000 years. The film's sequel, Crocodile Dundee 2, was a top five box office hit in 1988, but after that, the franchise seemed dead. Then in 2001, Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles came out and proved without a doubt that it was. Nominated in 2002 for the Razzie for Worst Sequel or Remake and sitting at 11% on Rotten Tomatoes, Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles was a box office disappointment and a critical disaster. The film's production was troubled as well. According to Den of Geek, there was a dispute over the script between screenwriting duo Matthew Barry and Eric Abrams and Hogan. Hogan extensively rewrote their screenplay and believed he should receive the writing credit. Ultimately, the Writers Guild sided with the original scriptwriters. They gave Barry and Abrams credit despite Hogan appealing the decision. Hogan told the Los Angeles Times, anyone who ever saw the first two movies will know who wrote whatever comes out of anyone's mouth, but because I didn't change the plot and I am the producer, I was not credited as a writer. 
In January 2018, teasers began dropping on the internet for what seemed to be a Crocodile Dundee reboot starring Danny McBride as McDundee's son. It was followed by a full trailer and a Super Bowl ad. You know, when your dad did it, he was he was much. Okay, and when my dad told me about this, he was just like, yeah, I just came up and he did, 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 did this. But it was soon revealed to be a $27 million ad campaign to revitalize Australian tourism. McBride told Insider, It wasn't like I was looking to do a Super Bowl commercial, but I just thought the concept of this was just too funny to see what people's reaction would be like. Australia's Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Stephen Chobo, told Tourism Australia, This is the single largest investment Tourism Australia has ever made in the US market and one we believe will grow annual spend by American visitors to $6 billion Australian by the year 2020. Fans hoping for an actual revival had their hopes dashed, though, when Hogan told Today, it's not going to happen. In 2020, Paul Hogan starred in The Very Excellent Mr. Dundee, a satire where he played a fictionalized version of himself. The movie depicts him getting into hot water on social media and meeting a bunch of other old comedy stars. Hogan told Boomer Magazine, It's not a deep, meaningful movie, just a bit of fun. While it pokes fun at Hollywood rules and how social media through the modern online community can give you a reputation that you don't deserve, it's mostly aimed at me. Hogan making himself the butt of the joke is certainly familiar ground for the Aussie, whose self-deprecating humor won audiences back in the 70s and 80s, though critics panned the very excellent Mr. Dundee, giving it abysmal scores on Rotten Tomatoes. In 2020, Hogan also released his memoir, The Tap Dancing Knife Thrower, My Life, without the boring bits. Hogan told Go Eerie that it was the brainchild of his longtime writing partner, Dean Murphy. It was Dean again who talked me into doing the book, telling me that if I dictated it, he'd write it down. So that appealed to my lazy side. Hogan might be done with Hollywood, but that doesn't mean audiences have forgotten him or that iconic role from The Land Down Under.